Hello everyone and welcome back to the Cyclocross Social Podcast. Today we're going to be discussing the 10th round of the UCI Cyclocross World Cup 2022-2023 and with me here to discuss the racing in Valdisol is Isam. Yes, hey everybody. We'll start by talking about the men's race. I was on the ground in Valdisol. I was invited by the organizers, the bike land of Valdisol. They invited me over. So yeah, that was nice to be there in the men's race. We had the fastest start for Kevin Kuhn. And in the first lap, he opened a small gap. But Niels van der Putte and Michael van Toerenhout closed that gap. That led to three leaders. Kuhn, van der Putte and van Toerenhout. Isabiet and Zweig were following closely behind and came back. Where was Macho van der Poel in all of this? He had a bit of a bad start. He was around 10th position, moved up a little bit. At the end of the first lap, he looked to accelerate to still try something. But he was 17 seconds down and from there on never featured in the race anymore. He took it relatively easy, sat in and wasn't taking any risks on what was a very slippery and icy course in Valdisol. From our group of five leaders, Michael van Toerenhout decided to up the pressure. He started pacing. And that led to first Isabit and Zweig being distanced again. Then Kevin Kuhn wasn't able to follow the pace anymore. And then eventually a lap later Niels van der Putte also wasn't able to follow that pace anymore. That Van Turenhout, the European champion, was putting on. Van Turenhout went on to win his second World Cup of the season. And he did that pretty confidently. He didn't really make any significant mistakes. He was in complete control and won by almost 40 seconds over eventually Niels van der Putte. Van der Putte needed to go deep for that because just after the halfway point of the race he had a puncture. That puncture however didn't stop him from getting that podium. Although in the last lap Kuhn who was fighting with Zweig came very close. Kuhn and Zweig were coming pretty close as said but Kuhn made a mistake too much in the final lap and that meant that Van der Putte could get second. Zweig was fighting then with Kuhn for that final spot on the podium in the final stretches but Kuhn had his eyes on his goal. He wanted that podium place and he eventually got it. In the final corner, Zweig was on his wheel but Kuhn gave this everything and got the first Swiss podium in a World Cup since 2013 when Simon Zahner did it in Hogerheide. In our preview podcast, Isam, we said that we didn't expect any major surprises here but we were pretty wrong because Van Turenhout, he went up against Macho van der Poel and he took the win here. You predicted him for second and we know he would do well on a course like this. He was already second here last year. He's such an all-round versatile rider. But still, a bit of a surprise that he wins here. But that was mainly due to Van der Poel having a bit of a weird race. Yeah, indeed. I mean, I think um, that the majority of the people didn't expect Van der Poel to, um, to have such a result as he had in the race. And I think that he surprised many and not in a positive way. But Van Turenhout was, uh, in my opinion, if you you know look at the race from last year, was was definitely one of the guys that already proved himself on a course like this, and he was in control basically from the moment that he was in the lead. Uh, Van de Putte, uh, definitely a, an outstanding performance from his side. You could see uh, definitely halfway through the race that Van de Putte was going to fight for second. And that Van Turenhout was uh, going off for victory if he didn't make any mistakes. And he consolidated well. He rode a flawless race and was able to to take the win. And I think that Van der Putte, uh, the puncture definitely didn't didn't help him. Uh, but, you know, he was he was racing for second. And when, when you give him an opportunity like that in a last lap, as we know, he's definitely one of those guys that, that has a fast uh, last lap. Uh, then it's for him it's uh, almost a certainty that he is going to stay in second but on a course like this you need to be uh, on your toes and he was definitely that he made sure that he didn't make uh, major mistakes in the last lap and hold off Kevin Kuhn who was uh, a name you mentioned I you know I, I thought that the Swiss riders will definitely be a little bit uh, more competitive than usual but I think that uh, Kuhn definitely surprised me and yeah it was a, a job well done from him first podium and uh, I think uh, everybody loved to see that. Yeah, we'll talk about Kuhn and Van der Putte a bit later. First, I would like to still talk about Van Turenhout because he deserves that. He deserves the credit for what could well and truly be his best season of his career, or at least until now. I mean, the European title was already super special. He came super close to winning the Koppenberg, but already in the early phases of the season, the win in Kruibeke, the win in Meulebeke, He's racking up a number of victories that he hasn't been able to do 
in the past. And then he won overijs, of course. And now Valdi sold two World Cups, both involving climbing. It's good for him. And the contrast between how Van Turenhout was riding and Van der Poel was riding was so significant. I saw Van Turenhout calm on the bike. He had the composure in the corners. He was going through them nicely. And then after the corners, he got on the power, released his power, put his pedals down and went for it. He accelerated relatively late on the brakes. And then in contrast, we have Van der Poel. Van der Poel, he looked super good in the pre-rides. Like Friday, the course conditions were completely different. I'll talk about that maybe in a bit later. I'll stay on the racing for now. But on Saturday, the course was icy. It was prepped overnight. It was made flat. The ruts were gone. It was pretty icy. It was pretty slippery. But nothing too serious. And Van der Poel, even in the pre-rides on Saturday, looked pretty fine. Like He was going up the hills nicely, through the corners nicely. But I think that in the end, in the race, the problem was that it was looking just as if he was riding in a pre-ride. He still looked super relaxed and comfortable through the corners. But there was no eagerness there. Like He wasn't accelerating out of these corners. He was releasing the pressure of his pedals well before the corners he was rolling in and then braking super slowly like he was afraid to slip or crash and there's a fair point to make for that it was a slippery course it is easy to crash here if you take risks on the other hand we saw that at the front of the race with the exception of Ezerbeet and throughout the entire pack not many riders got into issues so what is it I feel that what Adrie van der Poel said in an interview he was a bit scared didn't really like it that is probably the truth although if I saw him ride like in the pre-ride I think that if he had gone for it he could have done super well it's a decision he made I don't really necessarily agree with the decision I think you should always try like why start the race if you aren't going to try and here you come why did he start well if you don't try and still end eighth it's nice UCI points it's extra money for him since Flanders Classics pays him an extra to start these World Cups so yeah like that's what it has to do with but Still, it's not really a good promotion for the sport. Yeah, the money indeed. But yeah, I I think for Van der Poel that the start didn't help. And then he was in a a position that, you know, compromised him quite a bit. But he was, you know, 17, 20 seconds behind. So I think it was a manageable position, a position where uh, Ruwek was in as well. And later on, he fell a little bit more back with Bastans. And he, he definitely showed that he wanted to try... He yeah, had some signs in the first lap, especially the first passes of the finish line, uh, going on the paddles, accelerating, really trying, being eager. But when you have doubts on a course like this, it's very difficult to, to you know, you need to be very, you know, very conscious of your of your decisions in every corner. You you need to really go into into a corner without any doubts. And I, I think that from the pool the doubts that he didn't have in in the pre-ride when you are alone and you have nobody around you i think that for him the doubts were 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 kicking in and you know he is a rider that has uh, a lot to play for yeah the world championships for this this year with the cyclocross then obviously a spring season on the road i think that it it creeped into him um, that he didn't want to take a risk to to you know to fight for victory and 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 then in the end crash and have a have an injury that that is going to be lasting and going to be ruining your 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 winter. I mean, he had a not the greatest of winters already last year. That's definitely not something he wants to to have as a repeat. So I think that that maybe played a role in in, in Van der Poel's um, results in a way. But I think you know on Van Turnout deserves every credit. Was a you know an awesome ride from his side. The king uh, on the ice and the king in the snow. And it was uh, yeah truly um, good to to watch him uh, win. And I think the foundation was from last year eh, when uh, he won his first World Cup in Namur, and from there on he kind of believed in himself as a big rider and I think that that is um, that's what we see right now a very confident rider that that is able to win uh, big races yeah I mean to come back on the Van der Poel part which you mentioned you're 100% right he definitely looked a bit scared and I'm not entirely sure it was a pre-race decision although Adrie van der Poel is that did make it sound like that but you can't have fear you need to treat the course with respect But you don't need to be afraid for the course. If you're afraid for the course, the course will eat you. You're going to be making more mistakes like we saw Van der Poel make. You're going to be slipping and sliding. You're going to be careful. 
and usually the more careful you are the more likely you are to make some sort of mistake you need to go in it open-minded which we saw van Turenhout go his win in Namur was not his first World Cup win that was Tabor the year before Tabor was again with his first classified race win a week before in Merckx that was really a turning point in his career where he went from being a rider who was always on and around the podium to a rider who was always on the podium and sometimes on the top step and that continued now and he was the rider who treated the course with the respect it needed he wasn't taking insane risks but at the same time he was giving it his everything and he didn't make any silly mistakes in doing that so he deserved that win and I think we saw it in a similar way with the riders behind Van der Putte and Kuhn Van der Putte doing well is not a surprise either. He was already pretty good here last year when he was still under 23 rider. He ended 6th. But especially on the training I could already see that Van der Putte there together with Van der Bos, his teammate, they were going super well. Some of the Paul Sousa team managers stood next to me or their coaches. They were also saying, yeah, not surprising. He, they can go well through the snow. One of them will get a podium tomorrow. And they were right. Van der Putte is on the podium. Great result for him, he deserved it, even with that puncture he still gets the second place, would have been unfortunate to see him miss out on the second place due to that, but he got it over the line, gave it his everything as well and he looked super confident out there as well. Yeah, that's his trademark, he's uh, super good on the bike, you know on a race like this you can definitely utilize that skill. But I think that he's also in a in a good form this season. He has he had some uh, some good races, not so good races, but overall this season is um, yeah there is some growth in 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 the rider van de put, and I think that that in Valdi had uh, the course that you know that suited him well. He started well, and then you are in a position where you start believing in in in, in a good result, and I think that. You know, you look around you, you see Van, Van Turen out ahead, behind you, they are battling it out and you kind of start believing more and more in it. And, you know, s- fair play, especially after that puncture that can mentally really give a blow and that, that could have cost him maybe a podium, but he kept going. He he, he was able to bounce back from, from that puncture and then just started going um, as fast as he could. That's uh, <laughs> the least amount of mistakes uh, after Van Turen out and... He got the second place, which uh, you know is his first uh, his first podium, I think, in the World Cup with the elites, and his best result um, in a World Cup so far. So I think that for him, that is a big plus, and that is definitely something that you take with you at the end of the season. That you that you be like, okay, wow, that that race in Val di is pretty special. We then come to the rider right behind him, my man Kevin Kuhn. I was shouting on all day long. This is what well, it was, was his day. Like I said it in the preview podcast, and yes, the other predictions weren't correct. Even a broken clock is correct once or twice a day. And in this case, I got lucky with the Kuhn third. Although I wouldn't really call it lucky. I really saw it in him to end third here. It was a bit of a bold pick, but he delivered as I expected he would do. He made the progression this year. He became a rider who was always in the top 10. I think he has only finished outside of the top 10 two times this season. Or maybe three times. I don't know. It was just a handful of times. He's been super consistent in the top 10. And this was a course for him with the experience from the AKZ cross in the snow. Yeah. This was his day. Last year 7th. This year 3rd. Sprinting all out in the end to keep off Sveik. He deserved that. He rode a relatively mature race. I think he got a bit too excited in the early phase of the race when he had the gap. I think that cost him a bit. Because after the acceleration of Van Turenhout, he couldn't follow Van der Putte anymore. And it looked like he had blown up a little bit. But then he managed to fight back. So super good ride by him. And for him, the difference was just like the course. like the He had the feeling. He had the feeling, okay, I do this and everything is going as I want it to go. I think if the course would have been in a similar condition as it was Friday, he could have done even better. Because on Friday, the course was completely different. What happened was that... The course was prepped, it was cleaned, it was a layer of ice which was compressed, it was prepared by the snow cats. Then overnight there was 20 centimeters of fresh snow, this got shoveled off the course on Friday. The top layer was then again a compact layer of snow with a bit of loose snow on top of it. But then everything changed. It started melting, so the top layer 
got a bit softer and the layer on top was then again a bit of fresh snow but then it started snowing and raining so there was a layer of fresh snow on top of this soft compressed snow and the rain fell on top but then it started freezing so this fresh snow got like wrapped by ice so it got super slippery every corner every straight was super tricky i saw pick peters go down on straights multiple times kuhn was going around super nicely there so yeah if it's even more slipping and sliding i think kuhn could do even better but that doesn't really matter you need to do it with the course you have and kuhn did that and he delivered and he really deserved that and as I said, it was the first time since Simon Zahner, also in a snow cross, Hoge Heide 2013, a Swiss rider, a male rider, Swiss male rider on the World Cup podium, so deserved. Definitely deserved. I think that if he um, didn't get too much ahead of himself in, in the first lap, you know, we know that he's a fast starter, but I think after that he, he you know, went, I think, a little bit uh, too fast, and that cost him visibly. Then he was able to, um, yeah, to, to, to get himself back into the race. You know, Van Tornau definitely looked good, but Kuhn was, was very natural on the bike as well. And, you know, he, he felt very comfortable. And that's what you need on a course like this. When you are stressing too much, you're going to use just a little bit too much energy and you're going to compensate left and right. And with Kuhn, it was a perfect balance. It looked very good. And yeah, in the end, you, you come in a position and you could see it, you know, the way he was riding the last lap, like I can actually finish second or, or third and I can be on the podium for the first time and you could really you know you could really see that he you know was eager to do that on a world cup and he managed to do so pulled it off uh, I was also cheering for him because yeah, it's beautiful to see um, you know the, the, the Swiss as, as well on the podium and yeah it was uh, yeah beautiful scenes and it's proof that his form is good because the course was so icy and fast that the form played a relatively big role in this of course, the technique is still a factor, but it played a big role, and I think that was what Lauren Zweig, the rider who finished directly behind him, was lacking. A good Zweig would try and put a stamp on this race, and Zweig in the first lap was already hanging behind. He came back, but was constantly like yo-yoing behind Kuhn. He never really looked that good, and I don't think that was down to his tire choices or his technique, because he looked fine. He was one of the riders who did most practice on the course, but... It just didn't seem to work out for him. I think he wasn't at his best. Maybe the temperatures played a role, tiredness. It doesn't matter. Like He did, still did a good job for his overall World Cup. And he almost made like some applied or advanced mathematics from his tire choices. Because I saw him try so many things in the course practice. And then eventually he went with this white wall front tire. Which almost had no profile on it. And then I think it was a normal Grifo rear wheel so yeah he felt confident on that it looked good through the corners i just think that he was lacking a bit of form on the day freshness or form in general but it is what it is decent ride by him and as Eli Isabit unfortunately crashed and was injured and needed to be taken by carrier from the course he now has a well pretty stable lead it's more than 40 points i think on Isabit now on Tugendhat with his win did take back a bit of points but he's still over 20 points behind and with just four races left, including Zonhoven and Benidorm, which should be straight courses. Things are looking good for him, but they are not just about in the pocket. Let's look at our entire top 10 then. Van Turenhout with a win ahead of Van der Putte, Kuhn and Zweig, which I just told you. Then 5th place for Timon Ruek ahead of Vincent Baastaans and Pim Ronhaar. 8th place for Mathieu van der Poel ahead of Thijs Aarts and Corné van Kessel. I think you would like to say something still on Timon Ruek. Definitely, I think that um, he lost connection with with Van der Putte, Kung and, and Zweig, but he was uh, always uh, there thereabouts in, in in that fifth position. And you know, Isabit was ahead of him uh, at the time, but then fell through and in the end had the crash. But I think that Ruek, uh, as we uh, kind of hoped, he delivered uh, together with Kung, and uh, you know, both Swiss riders were were doing a, a great job. And Ruek, yeah, as well, looked very good in in the snow it was visible that his form is not as good as the guys in front of him but i think that his performance um, you know regardless of that was 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 um, outstanding and for him it's obviously a big plus because at the end of the season you can um, you know you can always uh, take this with you and uh, say at least i finished in the top 5 of world cup and i think that 
that is um, yeah something that <laughs> that uh, a lot of writers that that are on on his on his level or on a similar level cannot say and i think that for him that's a big plus and his his result is um, yeah is is quite outstanding on a course like this yeah good result for timon ruek he ends ahead of vincent bastans and yeah bastans season best performance at least in terms of world cup races good race by him as well and then to end the men's race, I would like to say good race by Pim Ronhaar. He was uh, almost all the way at the back at the end of the first or somewhere in the first lap due to some incidents. Made some mistakes but fought his way back to seventh. Good race by him. Tide is turning for him. His form is becoming better and better again. Let's go and talk about the women's race then. Italian champion Silvia Persico had the best start. But already in the second corner, we had a similar scenario as last week in Dublin. She went down. And with that, held up the two World Cup leaders, leader of the overall, Fem van Empel, and leader of the under-23 World Cup, Puck Pietersen. Both went down or were held up, and that led to Alvarado leading the race. She opened the gap, but that didn't last for all too long. After roughly a lap, Pietersen and Persico caught up, and we had three leaders. In the second lap, Pietersen thought, this is my time, I'm going to go for it. And up the steep climb, which was semi-rideable or it was rideable but in the women's race some riders needed to run it and that happened exactly in the second lap peterson rode all the way to the top alvaran and persico needed to hop off but peterson opened a gap and from there on she was gone off into the distance she went on to claim a win in valdisol but that was not done with the drama because fem van empel in that same second lap crashed she crashed into a pole and needed to be taken out by carrier she was injured the current situation on her is not entirely known. We'll come back to that in a bit. But that was the race over for the World Cup leader. There was still an interesting battle for second place because Alvarado and Persico had opened up a serious gap over the rest of the pack for the two remaining podium spots. Alvarado was technically way superior over Persico who kept making mistakes and crashing. She came back a couple of times but eventually that snapped. Alvarado went on to claim second. Persico looked to be in for third, but the amount of mistakes she made was just unreal. So many mistakes that eventually it caused Manon Bakker, who at some point was almost 50 seconds behind Persico, caught up in the final lap, in the final section of corners. She overtook Persico. Persico tried a very late dive bomb into the final corner, crashed doing that, didn't take out Manon Bakker, and that led to Bakker taking the remaining spot on the podium. It's a real shame that we didn't get to see Fem van Empel fight against Puck Pietersen on this course. But on the day, Puck Pietersen was just simply the best. Like, the overall package was was there. As I said earlier, form played a pretty significant role on this course. But yeah, the form in combination with the technique, hardly any mistakes. It was just all so good for her. Yeah, it was a smooth uh, and determined ride from, from Pietersen. Apart from the the a couple of small hiccups, it was um, the least amount of mistakes that I have seen from from the riders, and she was uh, the the strongest as well. And that was you know that is something that we already have seen over the course of the season that uh, Pietersen and Van Empel uh, are I wouldn't say levels above the rest, but they are definitely uh, at the moment the two best riders of the field. And you know when you are in such a position, Van Empel. Um, obviously um not able to 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 finish the race uh, then then you know you are in a, in a in a position that you have to take advantage of it and she just did that and it looked very good she was in control of the race and in the end um far ahead of the rest yeah i like the way she was riding around and it fits her like she is almost like a rock star figure in women's cross like She's just cool and she does these onboard videos the lap of the lap the day before the race and today the day after the race she goes snowboarding for six hours in the middle of the season. Like what other rider would do this? It's like such a rock star figure. She does whatever she wants. She came there by camper, not by plane like most other athletes. She does what she wants in her way, in her fashion. And that she then wins on a course like this where it's about having the balls or like the attitude to like go for it and just send it trust yourself feel confident slipping and sliding around a bit not getting too scared from that yeah it fits that she wins this race and i still had some doubts about how she would fade based on last season i still still think that she wasn't going all too great in the loose snow conditions that we saw on the 
Friday training, but that doesn't matter because those conditions were so tricky, everyone was struggling in those, so hat off to Puck Peter, so she deserved this, it was so fun to see her race like that, like, it was just cool to see her race around in these corners and, like, in front of my eyes, like, she just sends it through, so, yeah, that was definitely fun to watch, and she deserved that, and at the same time, Alvarado didn't look bad through the corners either, I don't know if you saw any of that on the TV, but... From what I saw, Avrada was not that much worse through the corners than Peterson, just that she made some mistakes in the early phase of the race, which Peterson didn't do, and that Peterson was just simply a bit better. She's on a higher form level than Alvarado is now. You know, to be honest, I said it, and actually the moment I said it, I was like, Alvarado didn't... <laughs> in my head, it, it, it came around that Alvarado was also looking quite good on the bike. She, But she was compensating with the form in my opinion i think that the form for her is is still not not on the level of, of peterson but i definitely think that she was also um in the snow didn't make that many mistakes and that gave her the edge in the end um in, in that battle that she had with with um with uh, persico i think that in the end that that definitely helped her out in a sense that you know her technique was was just uh, not a little bit but much better than than Persico who was making mistake after mistake had to compensate close gaps get back in front um and and there was a lot of pressure on her to i think that she really wanted to um to have a good result in in home country and first race back uh, in a world cup i think that she kind of felt some pressure which i don't understand but she really wanted to show herself and show the colors um, of the country um and i think that she did did amazingly well i think that you want to want to say something about that because you saw it uh, live yeah persico was actually something else like she has zero technique in the snow through the corners like it's actually insane how bad she is like on friday already like she was spinning in every corner <laughs> even in the easiest corner she was doing the weirdest things like in this left hand downhill corner on the big climb she was like hanging above her tube but what are you doing stay on the saddle you're losing control and then it's no wonder you go over your top bars and the same went on saturday like at some point paul herreigers the belgian commentator the world champion of Coxide, came up this climb where i was standing and he hadn't seen Persico ride all too much because it was her first lap and he was there with his big sunglasses, big jacket. Persico flies up this climb and was like, oh, Persico's going to ride top three. Oh, look how easy that is. I was like, well, maybe she's very strong, but you clearly haven't seen her go through the corners. And that's ultimately what cost her in this race because every lap there was mistakes and mistakes and crashes and some crashes that led to her chain falling off and... I don't know how her chain fell off that often because the Colnago bike which they use, which is an illegal bike by the way, it's not being UCI approved for cross, it doesn't seem to have this issue, or at least I haven't heard of it with the other riders that use the bike, that it's causing issues of the chain to drop, so probably she was still like shifting before the corner and not actually pedaling so the gear wasn't shift and then the chain is a bit loose so it falls off easier, so yeah, it was just a mess on her end, but... Here comes the part, she is so insanely strong that she compensated for that on the climbs, on the straight, with ease. And yes, eventually that caused her to blow up, she was already passing me like at the halfway point of the race, I could already see, oh, she is super dead, and that led to her making even more mistakes, but her form level is definitely good, and I am not going to be surprised if we come to a bit more dry race, flat, or maybe involving some climbing, if it's not too technical, I don't put it past Persico to be able to follow Van Empo and Peterson because that form level that I saw, that was also something else. That was so impressive. Yeah, indeed. That's why I wanted to hear your take. But on the TV as well, it it, it you know it really looked that she um, she had to compensate because of of the lack of technique in a way. But she was on some parts where you can utilize the your your power. She was really able to to showcase it, and it was a strong ride from her. You know, you first race back with you know with uh, the the big guns to say like that, and she was able to immediately show herself, <laughs> throw herself around with the top uh, top three and and fight it out. Then eventually, 
I think that the, that you know the way she um, she took she took the the race or she tried to do the race was maybe a bit too fast in the beginning, trying to compensate too much, maybe thinking that a podium was possible, and then in the end and losing out on on Bakker in the end for the, for the podium, who by the way had a very good ride. And I think that in the end, um, yeah, that cost her a little bit for the podium, but this really showed that she has grown over over the year on the road we have seen uh, some some great results podium obviously in the world championships on the road in, uh, so i think that she is yeah she's 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 a rider that you have to take into account and a dark horse on on a on a, fa- on a fast course i think that she doesn't do under of Van Empel and and, and peters on a fast course in my opinion i think that she is you know she has a, a big engine is uh, very talented uh, you know, is technically not not terrible, terrible, but on a course like this, you get just too much exposed, and it it looks even worse than than it normally is. So, I think that this is a you know a true talent, which I think everybody already knows, and uh, we might enjoy her um, this season a lot. I think in 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 you know the races that really suits her. Yeah, she was good, but I have to say the same for Bucker. Bucker put in a very good final lap. She was giving it her everything through the entire race. It looked pretty nice, but then in the final lap, she put in her fastest lap of the race when she knew that the podium was within reach. On the other hand, Persico put in her slowest lap of the race in the final lap. There's still a story that Persico had a bit of a frozen break that influenced her, but I can't really imagine that being too much of a factor because I don't know at what point in the race they should have been, but... If she would have gone in for a bike change at the final pitch, she was still ahead of Bucker, so she could still have beaten Bucker. But she still made many mistakes in that final up and down section, including that super late dive bomb which caused her to spin. And if her brake were frozen there, it just doesn't make sense because they just passed the pit. So I don't know what to think of that. But in that final lap, uh, Persico almost lost 40 seconds on Bakker. So I guess that tells you the story you need to know about Persico's race. Bakker kept going pretty steady throughout the race. Nothing too special. Nice for her to get a podium. For a while, she was actually fighting with Rochette. And that was pretty promising to see because Rochette, of course, you know the story. She came back from COVID, said that a couple of times on the podcast. Had a very heavy influence on the first part of her season. Took rest, worked back. Didn't have the best day in Essa. Now on a course that suits her and conditions that suit her. Fifth place. Good. She almost outsprinted Paris go for fourth. And to be honest, if it weren't for a couple of mistakes, like this steep climb after the bridge which she couldn't get up, she could have even been fighting for the podium. And that would have been, a, well, I would say a surprise based on how it would have gone. I think the main Belgian broadcasters weren't really aware of the fact that she had such a heavy season start. But still, good result, and I think that both Rochette and Bakker can take things forward from this race. Yeah, definitely. I think for both of them is a big uh, plus. Bakker, I would say, struggling a little bit in the beginning of the season, which was, um, you know, which is very normal, especially for her, uh, how she had to start the season. And I think that <laughs> you get a podium on the World Cup, as as I've said with Kuhn, it's just something that it's very special for those riders and. It just kind of gives them, a, yeah, recognition for for the training that they're doing, the amount of hours that they're putting in. And the same goes for for Rochette, you know, first race back in the World Cup and immediately at top five. It was you know quite a quite a good race. She wasn't far off, and you know that sprint with Persico <laughs> in the end, there there was definitely some grinta behind it, and um, she she definitely enjoyed the racing uh, that that was visible uh, and yeah it was overall from her side was definitely a good race i think that the form is is there's definitely some um, some potential in terms of growth that that it can still improve but i think that it is not not terrible that that is that is always a positive and that is you take that with you in the next coming races it's to wait and see if she is able to to hold that form and improve it but i think that for her it's um, for Rochette it's definitely a big plus and you know that will help her to you know, to get through the next coming races. But I think the type of person that she is, she doesn't really need that. She's motivated um, by herself most of the time. Then let's talk about the World Cup leader, Fem van Empel. 
it was a terrible weekend for her and it already started on Friday, the day of the training. Well, that wasn't terrible, but that already created the first question marks for me because that was the day of the training. Almost all riders came out on course, but then I heard, heard the Paul Sousa team coaches talk and they like the guy who was in charge of the men asked the guy who was in charge of the women where Femme was and the other riders that they had. And the story was that they didn't really fancy getting out on the course in the cold just after their flight there. And somewhat having to do with the conditions probably still going to change. They would practice the course the following morning and they would rather ride on the trainer. So the following morning I was already at the course at 10 o'clock when the racing started at 1. And the riders came onto the course and Femme did a lap, then did another lap at a bit higher pace. And then in the, I think it was the third lap, but it could also be the second lap. I'm not entirely sure. It was that she came up this steep climb after the second bridge, went down. And as soon as she got down, she got out of the saddle to accelerate. But everybody should know that if you're on an icy course and you get out of the saddle and take the pressure off your rear wheel, is going to slip. And that is exactly what happened. She, her back wheel slipped out and she crashed onto a pole with her knee. She stayed on the ground for a minute. Then she sat up, was still sitting there for a couple of minutes. Strolled towards the pits on the bike. And then talked with a couple of the staff members of Paul Sauer's in the pits. And went to the camper van. And that's also why I think there wasn't a pre-race interview with her. Because she went into the camper. That was already her first sign that Femme van Empel was not going to have the greatest of weekends. Because with only two or at most three laps of reckoning on this course you're not going to do well and then eventually the race still came and it may be a bit of a lengthy monologue now but i want to give the details since it wasn't on the tv after that incident in the first lap where she was held up by the crash of persico she was pretty far behind and in the second lap it was on the section where the barriers were this was just before pit one there was this straight and she was going to move up I was actually just telling my dad who I was with, Femme needs to move up now if she still wants to get to the front. I think it's maybe already too late, the gap is 20 seconds, but she can't stick in this group. And just as I say that, she starts accelerating to pass the rider at the front of that group, but in doing so, she gets out of her saddle again. And her vision on it is that her front wheel got into an icy rut and that she lost control over the bike due to that. That can be true, but I think it's important to add that she once again got out of the saddle. So if we combine these things, I think it's likely that she got out of the saddle. Her front wheel was in a rut, her back wheel wasn't. Her back wheel slipped out on the slippery surface due to again getting out of the saddle. Her back wheel slipped out, her front wheel had nowhere to go and she was launched into another pole, this time with her head. Her leg was also hurt and she stayed on the ground. She was screaming, there was a lot of pain. The doctors were stabilizing her, she got taken by carrier and then eventually she didn't go to hospital in Italy but she was having checkups today in the Netherlands which we don't know the results of. So yeah that was very unfortunate but I do think it's important to note that she made the same mistake twice causing her to crash and despite that being unfortunate and we don't wish injuries up up on anyone it's still a bit silly. Yeah, I, you know, we hope that um, that it's all um, not uh, that um, bad as it uh, looked in the beginning because I think, you know, the Belgian broadcasters were also there and, you know, they thought that it was that it was going to cost her uh, a couple of races and maybe even the season. You know, if you look at the medical updates right now, nothing seemed to be broken. Um, at least that's what they that they are saying right now. They still have to do some um, some checks. It is not uh, as um, as damaging as it as it seemed to look. And I think for her, you know, she she has that that lead in the World Cup. So for her right now, it's not going to be um, as bad. And then we have to you know wait and see if she's able to start in Havre. And from there on, you know, she has she has that lead still over Peterson. If she's going to skip Havre or, or, or maybe skip another race. You know, for her, it's now, um, you know, just make sure that, <laughs> that you recover from it. Don't get yourself too fast in, in into uh, the training and the racing. And just try to recover as, you know, as fast as possible, but also as good as possible. And that is probably the most important thing. Uh, try to recover as good as possible. Let's look at the entire top 10 then. Puck Peterson with a win ahead of Alvarado and Bakker. 
Persico in fourth ahead of Rochette, and then Schreiber in sixth. Seventh place for Helene Clausel ahead of Sarah Casasola, Sydney McGill, and Christina Zemanova rounds off the top 10. I think that there are not that many interesting things to discuss because there was a bit of a lack of depth in the field and that causes other riders to end in the top 10, which normally wouldn't end there. I would still briefly mention Marie Schreiber. I mean, she again puts in a good performance. I'd maybe hoped for a bit more in the predictions, but... Then again, it was a bit of a bold preview prediction and she did fine, just didn't have the form to compete with the riders up front. But again, she's just 19, things are looking promising and I would like to say the same for Zema Nova, who got her first ever World Cup top 10 here, also just 19 years old. Good to see another Czech rider who is coming through. Then outside of the top 10, one name who we can't forget, Kata Blanca Vash. That was a horrendous race by her because... She was still in the top 10 in the early phases, but completely fell through the ice and in the 21st. Yeah, after uh, not the greatest of races in, uh, in Antwerp, I think that um, we, we knew that that, fun, that Fash is going to have some some difficulties with the snow and the ice, but yeah, this was... Uh, yeah, it was uh, g- quite bad. I don't know exactly what, uh, what the reason was behind it, uh, apart from... Um, yeah from just her uh being uh not not having a, a great form but yeah it's um not a usual result i think despite uh, maybe the lack of of technique and i think for her it's just uh forget the race as fast as possible and and, and just focus on the next one because you know you can uh, think about these kind of races a lot but you can also look at it as a as a race which is atypical it doesn't really um, happen um, that often in the season that we have uh, ice and snow and everything around us and then it's just uh, try to pick up the training again and go to the next race and you know improve from uh, from Valdisol but that will not be that difficult yeah i expected her to not be good at all here in these conditions and her cornering was pretty bad and I think at some point when she was outside of the top 10, she just didn't really care anymore. Like, she was just like, well, it's not going to be for today, whatever. I'll see whatever br- the Christmas period brings. I'm not going to try too much anymore. Like, yeah, it's a shame, but it was always expected that she was going to struggle here, but not to this extent. Well, Isam, thank you for being here for discussing the World Cup in Valdisol. was nice to talk with you about it. Yes, thank you for having me. I hope all the listeners could hear me clearly because today when I flew back to the Netherlands my microphone got inspected because they thought it was suspicious when I wanted to take it through the security. Luckily I got it back here to record a podcast because else it would have been very difficult. But yeah, thanks for listening everyone. We will be back with a big, 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 big preview show this week. We'll be previewing all the crosses in the Kerst period. Looking forward to that, Issa. Whew. sometimes uh, I look very forward to it but then I uh, remind myself that it's also going to be uh, uh, taking some time from us but I um, I would just say that I look forward to it and uh, we will make the best of it for sure yeah so uh, it's going to be a big preview show this week and then after that the exact cross in Mole is our next cross on the program which takes place on Friday already thanks everyone for listening and goodbye <laughs>